Well, good afternoon and thank you so much for joining us with an in, for an In Conversation uh, with Minister Megan Scanlon, the Housing Minister. Uh, I'll begin by acknowledging that we're on the land of the Turrbal and Yuggera people and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, as well as any First Nations people that are joining us uh, online today, as well as the traditional custodians of all of the land across Queensland and indeed across Australia. Uh, my name's Amy McVie uh, and I'm the CEO of the Queensland Council of Social Service or QCOS and I'd like to really thank the QUT Centre for Justice for uh, sponsoring today's event. It is incredibly exciting to have uh, Minister Scanlon here with us today as our first housing minister in Queensland. Uh, the minister has been in the portfolio for, uh, standalone minister, I should say. The minister has been in the portfolio for about seven months now um, and uh, has taken management or leadership over a, of billions of investment into social and affordable housing and the Queensland government's big build. Uh, the minister's motivations um, and commitment to the housing portfolio are uh, deeply personal. Uh, the minister's parents both grew up uh, in public housing. Her mother was one of had, and her five siblings uh, lived in a three-bedroom house in Victoria, and her father in Anala. And I know that in uh, the minister's maiden speech, she talked about how out of reach home ownership has become for her generation when compared uh, to her parents. It's also uh, really clear that the minister has a really um, significant and authentic commitment to social justice. And I think uh, one of the ways that's demonstrated is by the fact that she was out during the uh, Kevin 07 campaign as a 13 year old um, campaigning and, and door knocking. At the age of uh, 24, the minister was sworn in and has um, quickly become um, Queensland's youngest cabinet minister in history. Uh, welcome, Minister, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me here. So um, I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. We know as the peak body for community organisations, QCOS is hearing so much about the level of housing need in our community, both, both for service users and also um, frontline workers. I know, you know you've been in the role for uh, seven months now and I'm keen to talk about some of the really exciting stuff that's already happened. You know, you've We've got a standalone housing department stood up, um, a new housing plans on the horizon and billions of dollars of investment into building social and affordable housing. But before we jump in, I'll just say we are um, in Zoom mode uh, and you, it's live. So you can um, put forward your questions at any point during the conversation. The minister and I can both see those questions. I would say that we have lots of people joining us today and lots of pre-submitted questions, uh, which have been fantastic and I am going to do my best to get to as many of them as possible. Um, but apologies in advance if I don't make it to every single one of them. And I do really encourage um, your active participation today. So Minister, I think when I, when I look at your, um, your bio and, uh, and from what we know about you, there's all kinds of delightful images that come out. But thinking about that 13 year old kid uh, already so committed to social justice. Uh, I wondered whether you could speak to us a little bit about how how did that happen at 13 that you were already so committed and so engaged? Yeah, I am. Um, uh, and look, it's probably overstating to some degree how involved I was in politics. I um, When I was 13, I, I turned up to the voting booth um, and there was no one from the party in which my mum wanted to vote for and that I sort of felt personally aligned to um, at Narang, which is now the electorate that I represent. And so I sort of said to mum, well, I'm happy to go and hand out how to vote cards. And mum really wanted to get the preferencing right. So we went to another booth to get the information. I got a shirt and I stood there. And what motivated me, I suppose, at the time were things like um, climate change. It was the first time mm. that I really felt like there was um, politicians who were who, who were quite genuine about taking emissions reduction seriously. Um, I also was really motivated by the um, uh, by the way in which the prime minister at the time um, was talking about reconciliation. Mm. And one of my earliest memories of politics was uh, watching the uh, rabbit-proof fence and um, the movie and thinking 
why have we not said sorry? And we had a Prime Minister at the time who was who was refusing to do so and I couldn't understand why we couldn't just do that very basic thing. And so those were some of the motivating um, reasons why I, I handed out how to vote cards. I didn't ever get involved though in a political party or in politics until a bit later when I got angry and, um, and was told by one of my friends that instead of ranting on Facebook and giving everyone your thoughts, why don't you actually get involved in the process and try and create change from, from the inside? And so I'm glad he gave me that advice because I wouldn't be here today if I didn't do that. Um, but there are, many, there are so many different moments throughout my life that I can see things that happen politically and the things that motivated me because of my family. And I think that's what most people, why most people get involved in politics is because they have some form of personal connection mm. Uh, my brother has a disability, he's got Down syndrome, so the NDIS was a massive deal for my family. Mm. Um, uh, all of those things help shape you and, um, uh, and you know, I don't think one politician looks the same. We all come from different backgrounds and I think that's what makes politics really exciting because we all come to the table with different views and perspectives. Mm. So I'm really interested in that sort of... Um combination of passion and anger <laughs> and um, you know wondering you know are there things I guess that you've um, been engaged in recently um, read been exposed to that have tapped into those kind of foundational values and things that you're still really committed to and passionate about yeah I am um, I most recently read um, Trent Dalton's new book Lola in the mirror and that was um I think anyone who has read it um, in the in the homelessness space or housing sector would have some would feel some connection mm. to that book, and I think anyone would have a connection in some way. And um, that 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 really, I mean, Trent is a beautiful writer. So even if you don't have a connection, I think you'd love the book. But really highlighted to me the complexity around why people experience homelessness, um, and and the way the whole system is set up, and how it really you know, it, sometimes it does leave people behind and how we can create a system mm. that ideally doesn't do that. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's probably the book that's most tapped, tapped into my heart recently. Yeah, great. And I guess, you know, seven months is not a very long time, isn't it? And <laughs> you've come out of um, another portfolio looking at environment and young people and into housing. Um, which is clearly one of the um, most important issues for Queenslanders at the moment. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about um, what you see as the, sort of those key achievements that you've made in the last seven months? Yeah, I am, um, and I've written down a couple of things because I think it's important um, uh, to actually write them down because there has been a lot of mm. uh, a lot of achievements made in the last six months. We still know there's a, a long way to go, though. Mm. There are a lot of people out there who are doing it tough. Um, and it would also be remiss of me not to acknowledge that some of this work started under former ministers Leanne Enoch, who's now heading up mm. the treaty process for government, and even Mick Debrini, who did that work previously. Um, I suppose some of the big highlights for me were coming into the portfolio, we were able to hand down the budget fairly soon afterwards, and we mm. saw an uplift in funding that now takes sort of our total investment to $5 billion. Um, we've already delivered around well, over 4,000 homes. We still have a remaining nearly 9,000 um, to, to commence by 2027. So there's a lot of work that needs to happen in a fairly short period mm. of time. Um, uh, we also got an uptick in funding for homelessness services, which is really good to see mm. because I know there's a lot of organisations doing great work on the ground who, who needed that additional funding to, um, to do more outreach, to provide more accommodation. Um, so there was more money to be able to purchase and lease hotels and mm. we've been able to make some of those announcements about those acquisitions. Um, the Park Hotel, we've turned retirement villages and aged care facilities into temporary accommodation. Um, we've also been responding to natural disasters disasters. So we've got those uh, eight tiny homes that have gone into the Gympie Recovery Park, which mm. are then going to be used um, as temporary accommodation once we've been able to assist people who uh, were impacted by a natural disaster. Um, we were just in Tara the other day where we've been able to quite quite quickly um, deploy caravans and modular homes mm. so that those people are close to where all of their animals are. Uh, um, many people in Tara, it, it, it appears, have many, many animals. And so it was really important that we provided people with temporary accommodation, but we were a bit more agile in our response to ensuring that people were close to their animals. Mm. And that was where we had to be a bit creative with caravans and um, looking at different opportunities. Um, uh, we've also been able to 
I think get the message. We're trying to get the message out there around all of the other rental supports that are available yes. to people, um, and we've seen some really good data recently that in the last quarter we've provided nearly ten million dollars um, in rental support that's mm. helped over one thousand six hundred families. We want to continue to make sure people know that's there so mm. that we can stabilise households. Um, ideally, make sure they don't enter homelessness mm. and. Um, uh, and you know that allows us to build more homes and keep people in the system. Um, uh, there's also been a whole lot of changes, I suppose, within the department itself. So the change, and I think the Director General may have touched on this when he came in, um, but we now have the remit of affordable housing. We have the Housing Investment Fund under the portfolio, which is good because it's not just the delivery of social housing, it's all of that other mm. work to ensure that there is genuinely affordable housing for people who aren't on the register. Um, and um, uh, there's been some changes internally um, around making sure that we have now dedicated growth teams, that we have a dedicated vacancy management team within the department. Um, I know the Director General is going through a process right now to try and employ more DDGs, which is really exciting. Um, so the whole way that we're responding as a government is shifting and really prioritising the work we need, we know needs to take place to, to wholly address the housing system. So it sounds, particularly when you um, speak to some of the work that's happened to build the capacity and capability of a standalone housing department, um, as well as delivering particular um, initiatives and investment, you've done some set up work to boost capability and capacity to deliver yep. uh, in the face of what is an unabating crisis. Yep. Can you tell me a little bit about what is exciting you about next year and in, in your portfolio? Yeah, I am. Um, so we, uh, you, you've captured it really beautifully around what we've done. And I suppose the next step is what do we want to do going forward mm. with that enhanced capacity? So we've been working on a housing plan that um, looks at the, 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 lo the long term. How do we make sure that we look at all parts of the housing system and appropriately address the needs of Queenslanders right now and going forward? Um, that's all going to be underpinned by modelling, which is really important. Um, and the enhanced capacity of the department is really crucial for mm. us to be able to do that effectively. And so there's a lot of work that's been going into that. And I know a lot of people want to see the plan. I probably I can't talk in great detail about the plan yet, um, but that's what I'm really excited about for next year. Fantastic. Hopefully we're not waiting till too long into no. the new year. <laughs> um, but I think you touched on um, this already, which is about sort of um, the piece that um, presumably goes before the plan, which is to really do the problem definition, to sort of look at well, what is the need for housing now and into the future. And um, our Town of Nowhere campaign commissioned um, Hal Paulson and his team at UNSW to uh, do a report that looked at housing need in Queensland and then looked at how we might go about addressing that and, and quantified that need as about 300,000 Queenslanders with unmet housing need. Now, acknowledging that that's just one um, data point in terms of what need in Queensland might look like, and, and you yep. just mentioned um, that the government's doing some modelling on that. I know um, that you've commissioned a hurry to do that, and I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about what is it that a hurry is looking at, yep. and what are some timeframes around um, you know that piece of work being complete? Yeah, so there's a couple of different stages in the work that a hurry is doing, and it's really looking at both the supply and demand side. Right. Um, uh, so they um, the first stage that they're working on at the moment is looking at the social and economical economic variables and um, modelling what is genuinely affordable housing. Mm. And so um, that's a complex piece of work. Mm. And um, at, so it's not just looking at population growth, it's looking at all of the demands that sort of wow. sit within that population. Yeah. It's the first time any state has done that work. So I'm really excited that we're leading the way. Mm. Um, at, uh, for obvious reasons, that's what we're trying to make sure a housing plan is underpinned by, and mm. so we need to make sure that the timing of that is is aligned. Um, but I'm really excited about what that what that brings. The Deputy Premier has also been doing work on the South East Queensland Regional Plan yes. update. They've got their own modelling. This is this is not just looking at population growth. It is looking at, as, as I said, at all of those extra mm. sort of demands that sit within the system, and we work out we work out 
where, where is the genuine need and how mm. do we respond to that in different ways. And I think you were potentially saying that there's some um, in that modelling some ability to look not just at a statewide perspective but yep. um, also be a little bit more uh, specific about where the need is. Yeah, so that'll be broken down into st statistical areas which is really exciting. At the moment we already obviously with um, with Quick Starts, which is one of our programs to build more houses, mm. um, we already have our own sort of system around how we work out where the greatest mm. need is, but this will give us a really good picture um, over, the, over the long term, but we'll also be able to continue to review it to understand in each statistical area, what is the need and how do we appropriately respond to that. And so I guess um, from your perspective, um, you know, you work with other housing ministers around the country as well as at a Commonwealth level um, to talk collectively about addressing Australia's housing need. Um, I wondered how, you know, how is Queensland going in terms of our negotiations with the Commonwealth Government? I know our partnership agreement is currently and into the new year being renegotiated. Yeah. And, you know, we would say that Queensland's the epicentre of the housing crisis. So how, do those how are those negotiations going? And yeah. is there some um, way of demonstrating that um, it shouldn't be about population size, but instead about the need that exists. Yeah, yeah definitely. And that's um, that's the point we recently made at our most recent ministerial housing ministers meeting. Um, Queensland's the most decentralised state, so it's incredibly expensive for us to deliver services mm. and to build, and that all needs to be factored in when it comes to national partnership agreements. Um, so we made that point really strongly. Um, we obviously also acknowledge we've received substantial investment from the federal government through, um, through their housing accelerator yes. program, which is just basically money that was given given to the states to build more social housing, which is great. We also have the Housing Australia Future Fund, again, really exciting, and we're working through how do we make sure Queensland gets our fair share of mm. that, um, but that there's more than just those two programs. And we also need to acknowledge um, that we've seen the National Rental Affordability Scheme, those homes progressively come out mm. of the system. So that was 10,000 homes in Queensland mm. that are no longer subsidised mm. once, that, once that program is completely finished. Um, and we no longer have the National Partnership Agreement on Remote Indigenous Housing. So, so it, it's really important that we really look at all of those needs and that every level of gov gov government is ambitious because we're obviously trying to be ambitious with what we're doing with our housing plan, but we cannot do it alone. Mm. The federal government gets 80% of the taxation revenue in this country. Local governments have a really strong role to play in planning decisions. Mm. We all have to play our part if we're going to solve the housing challenges. Yeah. So I know that you've said that you can't share much detail about the housing plan, um, but can you share a little bit with us about it? We'd love to know, um, you know, maybe at just a high level, what yeah. are we likely to see in the housing plan? Yeah, so we're looking at the whole housing spectrum. So we'll obviously be looking at home ownership, or, um, making sure that we're building social, enough social and affordable mm. homes that we need. Uh, we'll also be um, uh, looking at how we make sure we support our homelessness services and, and mm. hopefully support an end to homelessness. Um, we also uh, want to make sure that we're working with the planning system and local government and even industry on making sure we deliver cheaper housing closer to where people work mm. um, and supporting renters. So there's there's a whole range of components in that that have um, a lot of detail under it and a lot of complexity, but I suppose they're the overarching themes that you can expect to see. Great. I know that our um, Town of Nowhere campaign partners in QCOS have um, uh, advocated for including a supportive housing framework and investment into supportive housing in the plan. And we actually have uh, questions on that from a number of uh, members, including Simon from um, Queensland Alliance for Mental Health um, and Tara Gindi from Canefields Clubhouse in Beanley and also Tanya from the Princess Alexandra Hospital all asking the question of how will uh, the Queensland Government develop initiatives um, uh, to ensure that people with um, support needs 
yeah. uh, that or needs that need to be supported in order for people to sustain their tenancy and their housing. How will that be reflected in the housing plan, or and what is the government doing about about that particular thing? Yeah, we um, we certainly acknowledge that it's not just a roof over your head for mm. a lot of people. We need to add that additional support, and there are different models of how we do that. And I think we've already done some of that work in Queensland with our youth foyers. Obviously in Brisbane we've got the common ground and we've um, committed to building um, another supported accommodation um, set of units, almost 200, uh, well up to 200 units on the Gold Coast. We certainly acknowledge there's need across the state for different models of supportive housing. So that is part of the, that, that will be considered as part of the housing plan. Right. And again, I think that modelling will be really key to understand what are the different, different cohorts that we mm. need to ensure we're providing those additional supports um, for people who, as I said, we know need more than just a roof over their head. Yeah. There's also questions, um, you know, I don't want to labour on the housing plan when you've, <laughs> you know, sort of shared with us what um, you can uh, and we can all expect um, and anticipate to see more detail soon. Uh, but one of the things that's come through strongly in the questions from the audience is around supply. And you've sort of touched on the fact that the housing plan will be looking at accelerating supply of social and affordable housing. We've got um, questions uh, including from uh, Julianne from Concurry Justice Association about the overcrowding um, in her community um, that's there because there's insufficient supply. Another question about uh, people who are not necessarily eligible for social housing, um, but people who are on moderate to low incomes um, and needing a support with um, affordable housing, people who once, and you, and you sort of reflected on this in your main speech, was, you know, 10, 20 years ago, people could have been aspiring to home ownership and those same people can no longer, or are unlikely to have that aspiration anymore. So I guess touching on what you said about uh, accelerating supply of social and affordable housing, yeah. and then also, I guess, acknowledging that there have been really significant challenges in the building and construction industry, not just with, um, you know, getting the supplies and um, building uh, products that we need, but also in terms of workforce. I guess pulling together all those things, that sort of level of need across the community that's growing, a need for affordable plus social, and then putting it in, and then in consideration of the challenges, yep. What is government's plan really to accelerate supply of affordable and social housing? It's, and look, it is, it is a challenge right now. And if any, you know, I think anyone who suggests to you that it's easy to, to, to build homes at mm. scale right now, um, it has got their head in the sand because it is a really challenging market. That being said, I think it's a great opportunity for us to look at how we do things differently. Mm. And um, one of the things we've done is really try and scale up the modern methods of manufacturing. So homes that are built essentially yeah. in a factory, um, uh, uh, where we've obviously set up Q Builds facility um, in Eagle Farm. We've also just opened another one in Zilmia and there'll mm. be another one in Cairns. And that's really around um, creating those homes in a way where we're not disrupted by weather events, mm -hmm. we can pump them out quickly um, and it really helps us in those communities where we are really struggling to find mm -hmm. workers in particular mm -hmm. pockets of Queensland or there might not be somewhere for those workers to stay while they're building. Mm -hmm. um, so so that, that's, that's really helped us. Um, we've obviously had tiny homes in particular areas mm -hmm. and that won't always be appropriate but it is in some contexts. Um, we've, we're repurposing existing stock where it's vacant um, uh, we're just trying to be as creative as we can in the short term. I think long term, obviously, our priority is to increase supply, That be, be that social housing. We also, uh, there's also enormous opportunity in the affordable housing space. Mm. And we now have the Housing Australia Future Fund and the HIF2, which isn't just the delivery of traditional community and public mm. housing. We really want to make sure we're unlocking appropriately you know, appropriately priced affordable houses mm. as well. Um, at EDQ, one of the key commitments from the housing summit was to really look at EDQ's powers mm. and scope and make mm. sure that we can give them more capacity to do more. Um, it's a great, it's a great opportunity. The government has basically having our own our own developer who can mm. do some of this work. Um, and I know it's something the Deputy Premier has been working on closely with us as well. So um, yeah, I, I just think we need to we need to think differently. We probably need to be open to doing things particularly differently over the next few years. We also 
um, we also are providing free TAFE, free apprenticeships to try yes. and grow our own construction mm. workforce because one of the barriers is while traditionally we may have relied on um, international migration for some of those skilled workers, mm. again, those people need to have somewhere mm. to live. So mm. if we can get locals to get the skills and training they need, it means that we can hopefully deliver more homes, but um, uh, but those people already have an existing home to live yes. in, which is helpful. Yeah, great. So both um, Catherine from the Domestic Violence Action Centre and also uh, Tracy from Kungura um, Inc. have both asked really similar questions about, um, I guess, the impact of a last lack of supply on the capacity of women and children to seek safety. Yeah. Um, and both are speaking about women and children who are victim survivors of domestic and family violence uh, coming into shelter environments and then not being able to exit out into permanent housing options, which obviously then, and it's been put beautifully to me before by one of our members, is that that holds women and children in crisis, yeah. um, meaning they can't move on with their lives and uh, rebuild their lives. Um, and so I wondered, um, so that points to both an issue about supply of social and affordable housing, which you've already spoken to, but what's also being highlighted to us is the need for uh, more crisis accommodation. Uh, what is what is the government doing, I guess, specifically uh, for domestic and women and children escaping domestic and family violence, both in the crisis and, and, and in the long term? Yeah, there's... It's, it's a good question and we, we, um, we obviously have additional funds for, uh, for emergency accommodation and specifically allocate some of that for um, women and families escaping domestic and family mm. violence. Um, the federal government also has some additional money that they've announced recently. Um, we, we also have our flexible assistance package within the department mm. where they, there's a, and it's flexible, in its name and mm. its nature um, to help people for the, in those next steps or in a crisis. So it allows mm. the department to assist people when they may be exiting crisis accommodation mm. into a more, a more permanent home or even in that transition. Um, and so we are doing, a, we've been doing a bit of a review to make sure those what we call products and services basically you know, different different programs where we provide people with funds to help them to make sure that they are fit for purpose. And um, uh, again, that'll be something that we'll look at in the housing plan. But I think it's a really good point around we we need we need both we need both crisis accommodation, but we also need more homes for people to exit into. Um, there will be cases where people don't need social housing, but they do need affordable housing, mm. or they might need private mm. private. They might be able to maintain private tenancy, but just need a bit of extra help with those mm. moving costs mm. um, and even a bond a bond loan. So that's where we we're, we're looking at all of those different options that are available to try and help stabilise people so that they they are safe. Yeah, yeah. And so the other um, one that comes up a lot and has been asked here um, by Belinda from Ellerac Place Community Centre, uh, she's asking about young people in particular. So I think a lot of our members um, talk about their work with children who are uh, 16 or younger, um, you know, teenagers, but not older teenagers, you know, yeah. and um, their particular support needs. So they're not necessarily able to live with their family. Uh, they probably do have the capacity to develop with support some independence in terms of yeah. uh, living. Um, and they're not necessarily children that need to or um, come into contact with the child protection system. Yeah. So um, Belinda's question here is really about uh, what is it um, that you and your government are doing to assist that particular group of young people? Yeah, we're, we're doing a lot in this space and we developed um, the, the Youth um, Homelessness Housing Action Plan. So there's a, number of, there's a number of actions and funding attached to those actions. Um, uh, uh, we obviously are developing more youth foyers and, um, and different forms of sort of supported accommodation for young people mm. in different areas and that's really important. Um, uh, we've also, um, uh, we do recognise that there that a lot of young people who are on particular sort of federal government payments that that money is dramatic, well, quite substantially lower than yes, other payments, yeah. and so that puts young people at a disadvantage in getting into even community housing, n n not even just the private sector. So uh, we are looking at how we can make sure that we really assist young people because if you can help that young person mm. at those critical 
cri that critical time of their life, then they'll probably go on to live independently, but mm. they just need that assistance for whatever reason mm. for a few years. So um, again, that's sort of a key part of the housing plan that we're looking Great. at to make mm. sure that we're addressing the needs of young people. Um, and you'll see more start to take um, take form that were the key actions as part of that um, youth um, the youth homelessness plan. Um, we just announced some funding the other day which was specifically helping young people who are exiting any sort of government service, so that could be a youth foyer, for them to you know, then, then maintain private tenancy and mm. move out. So that could be their moving costs, it could be um, getting them um, a, a go-card to be able to get to and from work, a uniform, mm. like all of the things that most young people need. And if you've got your parents or caregivers there, they might be able to assist, but a lot of these young people don't have those supports. Mm. And so um, that flexible package will allow the department and specialist homelessness services to work with that young person to make sure that their needs are being met in that next stage of their life. Yeah, I think some of the most troubling stories that we hear are about the growing number of young people sleeping rough and, um, you know, connected then to other issues like um, youth crime. You can really see that, as you say, if you um, build the agency and independence of, of the young person, yeah. um, there is great capacity and resilience within yeah. people to, um, you know, get engaged in employment and build towards independent and a, and yeah. a good, independence and a good life. And I guess that speaks to really, doesn't it, the value of housing and, and why we're all here. Yeah. Yeah. If you did mention um, when you talked about some of the key things in the housing plan, um, you referenced the private rental market. So yeah. I'd love to move to that if that's okay. Um, Anglicare recently um, produced a report, which you would be aware of, which demonstrated that the housing crisis is not just having a really significant impact on the people that use our service, but indeed our workers themselves are um, having huge trouble paying the rent. So the Anglicare report so showed that regional Queensland is the most unaffordable place to live in Australia and that um, zero to one percent of the private rental housing stock that's available in regional Queensland is, is affordable for our workforce. And shockingly, uh, we hear all the time our members telling us that their workers are indeed living in cars or caravans. So they're you know, these are workers, predominantly women, mm. who are spending their days caring for others, providing support, providing um, love and assistance to the most disadvantaged people in our community. Mm. And then after an exhausting day, uh, going home to sleep in a caravan or a car or a hotel room. Um, it's such a stark image to think about our workforce in those conditions, fully employed and yet unable to pay the rent. It's really, um, I do have, a story here about a woman in Cairns uh, that's come through um, who's saying uh, that, you know, in this instance, the person she's working with is on the age pension. She's um, not eligible for social housing. Um, her rent costs uh, $300 a week, which means she basically has no money for other expenses. With all of that, I guess, um, we're really desperate to know what the Queensland Government will do as quickly as possible to take that pressure, that yep. cost of living off pressure off families and to make sure that they can pay, afford to pay the rent. Yep. I suppose, you know, and we know that there are people doing it really tough out there at the moment and, and that's 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 exacerbated, I think, by we've seen a massive amount of um, not only international migration, but a huge amount of interstate migration. Yes. The RBA cash rate changes are putting pressure on families and we're seeing people that never probably needed government support before turn to government for help. And so it, it's a whole lot that's happening all at once. Mm. Um, I suppose in terms of the, the rental stress that people are experiencing, you know, when you look at the data, we have an incredibly tight, um, tight rental vacancy mm. um, space at the moment. And so mm. uh, one of the things we are focused on is making sure that we unlock as much supply as possible. And that's why we're trying to work with councils to try and unlock more houses and appropriate mm. 
appropriate dwelling. So uh, at one of the things we're doing in the South East Queensland Regional Plan in particular is looking at dwelling supply targets yeah. so that we ensure that there's a level of social and affordable housing when we're unlocking more supply and that we have different density types um, and that will hopefully then unlock the types of homes that we need that we need for key workers mm -hmm. so they're close ideally to public transport and all of the things that you need when you when you're working mm -hmm. um, at in that while we do that, we acknowledge there are some people who are who need additional help. And so that's where we're stepping in with some of those rental grants and subsidies. Mm. And so what I'd say to anyone out there is please engage with the department. We have a whole range of supports that are available to help people. We topped up that payment to up to $10,000 to be able to help people just bridge the gap. If they've got an increase they can't, they can't afford, we can step in and assist. If um, you've gotten behind on your rent, again, we can, we can step in and assist. Um, we also have bond loans and a whole range of other mm. products that are available to people um, and, um, and in particular as opposed to key workers. I know the department has engaged with specialist homelessness services mm. in the past to make sure that we're supporting the workforce who does amazing work on mm. the ground. And so if there are, if there are organisations out there that are struggling to make sure you connect with us and we'll try and do everything we can. And I think that's um, certainly what we hear across regional Queensland as well from our workforce yeah. is that in our local communities, uh, well, the feedback I've received is that people do really feel like the frontline workers in Department of Housing in those um, housing service centres are real colleagues that are really willing to, to, to do what it takes to get people support and assistance. So I do think that's a really important message is that um, those local service centres do have a lot of um, payments, a lot of um, assistance that can be provided, yep. even in an environment where the social housing register is really under pressure and there isn't, you know, there are wait times a yep. lot of the time, there are other things that can be offered. Definitely. And we have Rent Connect officers who can help people. They've seen a big escalation in their workload. Mm. Uh, the, the, the work the department does is much more broad than it ever used to be because mm. it has to be because of the situation that we're in. So yeah, I, yeah, again, encourage anyone to reach out to the team. Yeah. So um, when I um, was speaking to uh, the Director General, Mark Cridland, in October in a very similar sort of setting, uh, and I, I hate to um, misquote you, Mark, if you're online, <laughs> I, he spoke about the uh, reforms that are happening, um, the tenancy law reforms that are happening. Yep. There's already been some progress made under your government and then we're looking at stage two. Two. Yep. Um, Mark did talk about some modelling that was underway to understand the financial impact of stage two. Yep. I wondered if you could briefly step us through sort of what those key reforms were in stage one, yep. uh, what stage two is likely to look like and, and, and an update on that financial modelling. Yeah, yeah. So the, um, we have, uh, as we did with stage one, we've undertaken modelling for stage two. Um, uh, stage one, just despite what you may read about. Stage one, um, the modelling showed that it would have a negligible impact on the housing mm. system, but obviously deliver really important reforms. Mm. Um, stage two, um, uh, we expect to be similar. And um, um, from the, from memory, the um, the reforms that we put out for consultation, and obviously it's still before government, um, were around making minor modifications um, to a property, um, uh, around making, making sure that we have fairer fees and charges around um, simplifying the rental application process. Um, uh, there, there was a whole range of changes within there also around um, at the bond system itself. Um, and one of the things we added to it that I've publicly announced is that mm. we would um, be looking at that loophole that's mm. been established around um, the annual rent increase limit. So it's very, our legislation is effectively similar or the same as every mm. other jurisdiction. Um, uh, which was limiting the amount of times your rent can increase to once a year. Um, we have seen some behaviour from some people who are effectively uh, going having six month leases and kicking that person out so that they can then get um, that they can get more money from that mm. new tenant. So we're looking at how do you close that loophole. One of the suggestions that was put forward in the consultation paper was attaching that to the property yes. rather than the, the tenancy agreement. Mm. Um, and so we'll look at that as part of stage two as well. But I'm hoping that we'll have that out soon um, because I acknowledge 
people have advocated for these reforms for some time and it's, it's really important work. It is really important work and I think that's a really interesting point about the financial modelling because oftentimes when we engage in this conversation about making um, the private rental market fair or making renting fair, yeah. um, the pushback against that is around the financial impact that would have. And, yeah. and we know that stage one, did, you know, the, the independent modelling did show that that, yep. that myth was debunked yep. um, and that actually, um, you know, it wouldn't have those dire consequences yep. um, that some say that it would. Um, we know that um, more than 30% of our community rent uh, and that will be a long-term housing solution for so many people into the longer term. So yeah. I guess for our sector, given so many of our workers are renting as well as the people that use our services. And as you say, so many people are now uh, in a different, with the same income, yep. in a different type of situation than they would have been decades ago. So yeah. that. I guess reform around the private rental market has never been more needed. Yep, yep. And I think we've got we've got a level of consistency through national cabinet too mm. with a whole range of the reforms and so that is helpful in that we've all signed up to the same yes. reforms yes. and so um, there can't be the suggestion that investors would go to one state over the other because right. of these reforms yeah. that consistency means we're all doing the same thing and we're all we're all mm. tracking ahead. Yeah, that's really important. You mentioned before about the withdrawal of NRAS yeah. and um, Claire from Brisbane Legacy has asked a question, particularly um, they're seeing a lot of older war widows older war widows are struggling with insecure housing. Yeah. Um, and Claire's asking specifically as um, NRAS draws to an end, what is the government doing to make sure that people in those properties aren't ending up um, homeless? Yeah, it's a good question. We, um, I, I suppose the department, uh, de the department can provide support to people who may, have, who may have be exiting an NRAS property, particularly where they're eligible for social housing. Mm. And so, uh, you know, if there's anyone who um, is in that system, or if you are a service and you're working with those individuals, it's really important that they're engaging with the department so that we can make sure we can help them with their next step. Um, we are, however, stepping in and purchasing some of those properties. Mm. We've already, through the Housing Investment Fund, I think agreed to purchase over 300. A number of those have already been um, purchased and there are tenants in them. And the next tranches are happening, there's a, a, um, that work's happening at the moment with um, Coast to Bay and, um, uh, and another community housing provider that I've forgotten off the top of my head. And uh, what we've said though is that we we are also interested in buying more than that. We acknowledge mm. that there's um, still a number of those homes in the system and where there is a willing willing owner who wants to sell to the government at a, at a obviously a reasonable rate, we are very open to purchasing more of those properties. Um, we have come under some criticism for using the Housing Investment Fund to purchase those homes because they're not necessarily new builds. We think it's a very different circumstance because these are homes where it's subsidised housing, those people will be exiting those homes and many of them who would be then going onto the social housing register, if we can stabilise those people in that home, mm. that's a better outcome for everyone. So um, that doesn't take away from the fact that the majority of work the Housing Investment Fund does will be building new homes, mm. but we think there's a place for the acquisition of these homes given the very specific nature of the National Rental Affordability Scheme. Sure. So I guess, um, you know, what we can see is a real, um, a really significant level of need in Queensland in terms of addressing um, housing insecurity now and going forward, particularly as you say, with increasing um, interstate migration as well as a return to normal in terms of um, overseas um, migration. Um, and so we see that need and then um, a, a level of ambition that says we, we want to address the need, yeah. um, but we need partnerships um, in order to deliver the level of supply in particular that's required. And yeah. I know that the Paulson report, which we commissioned together with the Town of Nowhere campaign, uh, found that, and, and this report suggested that to end the crisis, as opposed to shifting the dial, we would need around 11,000 new social and affordable housing dwellings per year for the next decade around 2,700 new social housing dwellings. Yep. Um, 
you know, it, I think it is also the case uh, that the report makes it clear that, that the state government is unlikely to be able to deliver that type of supply without a partnership approach. And you've spoken to yep. the role of the Commonwealth. Um, given our audience is likely to be many of our members, our wonderful community organisations, and we've got quite a few questions on this actually about the role the community services sector plays in partnering yep. with government. So Shelley, uh, sorry, Sally from Shelter Housing Action in Cairns, hi Sally, says, um, do you have a vision um, for uh, our specialist homelessness service uh, system and Stephen from Encircle is asking about what we can expect in 2024. Uh, Kelly's asking um, what support is the Queensland government planning uh, to provide for community, community housing providers and will additional funding be made available? So yeah. those go together to sort of say, Minister, how do you see our sector playing a role in addressing Queensland's housing crisis? Yeah, I think we need everyone to play a part. Um, uh, with the community housing sector in particular, we've um, we've partnered with Q Shelter Chia mm. um, uh, to do to do um, a program to really lift the capacity of some of our CHPs, um, community housing providers mm. in Queensland, um, because we have the housing investment fund where there's a, a significant amount of funding available, um, and we'll have the Housing Australia Future Fund again, a significant mm. amount of money that's available. We need to make sure that all of those organisations are ready to be able to put in an application mm. and actually deliver those at the mm. scale that we need. Um, and so, so we're funding that program and really excited to see a number of CHPs take up that opportunity. Mm. Um, we also threw um, one of our other programs, Quick Starts, mm. and look, I'm, I'm not a big fan of any of these names. I think it's easier just to say we're building we're building thousands of homes yes. and we want to partner with people. So, so one of the programs we have um, we had we, we we have a bit of an aim internally around how many homes we want to try and partner with the community housing sector on. Mm. Obviously, that depends on how many people um, apply. Mm. Um, uh, there's there's a huge amount of money out there at the moment, which mm. is really exciting. I think it's about making sure we have the capacity to take on right. those projects. Mm. And so um, we're just working through that with with CHPs. Obviously, CHPs obviously uh, will also be doing the. Um, putting forward applications around those NRAS properties. Mm. Um, so, so I foresee that there to be a, quite a significant increase in the amount of community housing homes we have in this state. That being said, I also think there's a place for public housing to yes. increase. We can mm. do both of them. Mm. We'll To be able to reach the scale we need, we need everyone mm. reaching the highest capacity that we can. And um, uh, that's what the plan will be focusing on. Yeah, and then I guess it's also taking that pressure off the system, isn't it? By making yep. sure that where people have capacity to engage in the private rental market, that that market is affordable and fair. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing I should have mentioned too is ED, Economic Development Queensland. Mm. I think there's also a, a huge opportunity for them. And we did a statewide land audit to determine where there yes. are parcels of land available. Um, and some of those are in prime locations, so mm. they'll be big. Um, big developments, which mm. is really exciting. Um, so they take they take some of that responsibility, which is good. Um, and there's also, I think, a role for for developers to play as well. Obviously, mm. there needs to be conditions put around mm. um, the way that we do those um, uh, those partnerships. Um, but if there are developers out there who 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 want to deliver social and affordable housing, mm. the Housing Investment Fund allows us mm. to do that, which mm. is exciting. And so with those EDQ developments, will yeah. they include uh, social and affordable housing? Mm. Yeah, so the ones that we've announced to date, um, a number of them do. Some of them may be more. Um, I know one of them on the Gold Coast mm. Illumina project, we were saying that, that we've, we've suggested that that would be for sort of student accommodation mm -hmm. or health worker accommodation, mm -hmm. so some level of affordable. We'll look at them on a site-by-site -site basis um, and make sure that we are getting a mix of social and affordable in them. Um, uh, and again, I think that's where that, that broader modelling will be really important because it'll determine how much we need to spend in each region yes. and, and making sure we get those numbers right. So in some areas it may not necessarily be appropriate, but in other areas we may go well beyond what you would expect on a particular site. Yeah. And then I guess um, overlaid with, you know, where the need exists, yep. I guess it's also the type of need that exists, isn't it? Yep. So um, we've got a few questions here that speak to um, the need uh, for in particularly in remote communities and for First Nations people. So we know yep. that there are 
uh, really high levels of housing need in remote communities as well as really specific challenges associated with addressing that need. Yeah. Um, Douglas from the Warrabinda Aboriginal Shire Council is asking, um, as a First Nations person required to pay for repairs on rental houses, um, and we don't have those services and hardware stores available, you know, what is the solution? Uh, Eden online at the moment is asking, uh, what is the government doing specifically to assist Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, in general yeah. and in crisis? Yep, great questions. Um, uh, We've, we increase money in the budget to make sure that we uh, deliver more homes in remote and discrete communities. Mm. Um, we've also got money allocated for the delivery of the second Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Housing, housing Action Plan. And I know the department's been um, engaging with um, communities to make sure that the, the priorities within that document are right. And so mm. you'll start to see actions in that like they were in the first action plan, um, the, the point um, made about maintenance and repairs is a really good one. We mm. obviously have QBuild who manage a lot of that work on behalf of the government. Um, but I think the broader point being that, you know, we also need to make sure that that we empower community controlled organisations mm. in many of these communities and individuals um, to be able to take on some of the employment opportunities mm. from the maintenance and repair of these homes or the delivery of these new homes. One of the great things our government has is the Ministerial Champions Program where yes. each minister works with a, a remote or discrete community. The community I work with is Mornington Island and um, I know this is something the Mayor's consistently talked about around how do we make sure that you know people who are living in Mornington Island are given the, the the skills and training opportunities so that they can then be a part of the projects that are mm. happening in their community? Um, that 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 branches across multiple different departments, and so I think we're we're still working through that. But um, they're really good points, and I think that's the key. That's the that's the key to government actually doing these specific plans is that we engage with community, we listen to the voices of of people in these communities around what they would like to see, and we mm. change systems. We need to be, we we need to have a different approach given the 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 how big Queensland is. It's about 200 times more expensive for us to build, I think mm. it is in the Cape than it is in Brisbane. Yeah. So, so we have to be flexible. We have to do things differently and we need to listen to locals on the ground. Yeah. So I guess another um, focus area for many has been to respond to that alarming statistic that the uh, fastest growing group of people experiencing homelessness are older women. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to what the government is doing specifically to meet the needs of older women experiencing homelessness. Yeah, we had the um, the older women's um, hub, which is really, um, which is they do fantastic work. I met with them recently in, in Brisbane, and um, we've made a commitment to expand that program to other areas. And uh, when you look at the types of homes we're building, they have generally been sort of single in some mm. cases two bedroom homes, acknowledging right. that that was the sort of increasing cohort of people that we were seeing on the register. We have actually in the most recent quarterly data seen a slight reduction in the amount of single single dwelling households yes. and an uptick in families. And so that quarterly data, it's the first time we've ever released quarterly data. It was a commitment I made early in, to coming into the portfolio mm. um, so that we could be more transparent about what the register looks like, but also to allow us to be to provide a quicker response when we're seeing those trends change. And um, so um, I know the department, obviously, I, I think that's a key part of the modelling as well, to look at what are the different cohorts of people? How do we make sure that the build is appropriate, mm. but also that the supports are appropriate depending on that, that those cohorts of people. Um, I also know, I think Minister Brenny started this initiative, which was with um, the chief architect about doing some different styles of build and there's mm. a really great build on the Gold Coast in Southport which was sort of designed for older women and they are beautifully designed mm. um, that really take into account the views of the consumer and we mm. need to do that more often mm. I think making sure that the places we build actually reflect the individuals who are going to move into them. Yeah so you talked there about the sort of um, and can I acknowledge how um, important it is to hear you talk about greater transparency and releasing data more regularly and responding to the need you're seeing quickly in terms of, okay, where are we making 
inroads, where do we need to put more efforts? And I, I, yeah. I've heard you speak about in the last quarterly data, as you've just said then, um, a reduction in the number of single households, but still an increase in the number of households with children. Yeah. Um, and given the also um, the average wait times um, for social housing can be more than two years, um, you know, it's obvious that we need to do more for families with children. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about what uh, the Queensland Government's plans are to address those particular needs? Yeah, um, and I should just go back to the previous point about yes. older women as well, because uh. I've, I've just remembered a, a, a further point, and that is obviously we're, we're, we're delivering those. Um, we are making sure that we're, we're building homes that are appropriately, appropriately designed for the people that live mm. within them. Um, but we... Um, I've actually now forgotten the point, but anyway, I'll come back to it. The, the families, the families' response is really yes. um, we just we just increased funding through our immediate housing for families response fund, yes. um, and so that's effectively for temporary accommodation yes. for families who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness. Um, we're hoping that that uplift helps um, helps those specialist homelessness services mm. in making sure that we capture and assist all of those families who are mm. in need. Um, that, that new data has really allowed us to understand where our capital focus needs to be on. And so we are looking at more properties that are specifically for families. Mm. We're also um, looking at how do we how do we work with tenants who are in under-occupied homes yes. to, um, to consider moving into a, a smaller home that's more appropriate to their mm. needs and often a new build. So it's, mm. um, it's you know, beautiful and, mm. and new and often more accessible for an ageing mm. population. So to free up homes for families. Mm. We don't think that we should be kicking people out. That needs to be done on a voluntary basis. Um, but the department is working through how do we how do we engage better with tenants who are already who already have a social home more regularly to make sure we meet that person's mm. need, but also that we're really looking at how we utilise the homes that we mm. have for the right cohorts of people that's quite complicated and um, it, it's very labour intensive for the department, but I think it's really important work and it's something that we're sort of focusing on as we respond to some of the recommendations from the Queensland Audit Office. Yes, yeah. um, And um, uh, that'll start to roll in over time. Yeah, and I guess it's another, you know, that sort of multi-pronged approach to um, what the data is telling you about the growth and need for families yeah. and with children also speaks to not, it, it speaks to looking at what are all of the things we have at our disposal. So, yep. you know, empowering and investing in services to have that frontline capacity to respond, but yep. then also looking at existing assets, how can we better use them, as well as then looking at, well, and then how do we increase that supply as yep. well? Yep. Um, and so it's really lovely to hear you talk about the multiple data sources that you're relying on too, which is to yep. say, there's um, a piece about uh, what you're seeing through the housing data, but there's also, you know, and I can speak to this um, from our members' perspective, such strong engagement by you and your department with our sector as well to understand what people are also seeing on the ground and what yep. they could do uh, to immediately deal with the need that's in front of them. Yep, yep. And it's really helpful for us to hear that real-time information yep. because it gives us an insight before we see the data. And yes. there are many of your members in Specialist Homelessness Services who have been saying families, and so that's helped us yes. already start to go, how can we make sure we're looking for places that are appropriate for families, and then that was then solidified when yes. we got that quarterly yeah. data. I remember the point Great. that I was <laughs> yeah. going to come to for older women, and that is the federal government has um, just introduced the Help to Buy Shared Equity yes. Scheme, which I'm really excited about if it passes, um, uh, and Queensland will have to deliver enabling legislation to make sure that that can can be delivered in our state, but that's really critical for low to middle income earners who may not ordinarily be able to purchase a home, mm. but the government effectively hasn't has a portion of that home. They own a portion of that home and you can pay it off over time or the government, when you sell it eventually, the government would then get that portion back. It will allow people who have never been able to enter the market to be able to do so. And yes. I suspect we'll see a lot of um, older women be able to finally purchase their own home through that yes, scheme. Yeah. And look, 
we are running out of time and I've got a whole bunch of questions still here. So I'm really sorry, I'm not going to get to them, but I'm going to start speaking really quickly. No, just joking. I'm going to try and get to a few. And Emily online has um, talked about getting young people um, who are currently trapped into renting into ownership. And I think some of what you just spoke about then, yeah. Minister, is really relevant to that, which yeah. is to say that the federal government is putting forward a solution that looks to how we leverage the capacity that people have together with what government can provide to support people into ownership. Definitely, definitely. And look, we've also um, increased the first homeowners grant, which we're hoping um, young people take yes. advantage of. And that's quite strict around it has to be for new builds. Um, uh, but yeah, we are the housing plan will look at the home ownership piece as well. It's 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 a difficult area, and I don't know if anyone's. Um, I've just started reading the quarterly essay that really yes. looks at the whole broader housing system. Um, there have been some of these things are beyond state government control. Some of the taxation policies mm. obviously fit within the remit of the federal government, but we're looking at what we can do. I wish we had both read that essay before we yeah. came on today, but <laughs> another time. Yeah. Um, Look, we've, we don't have much time left, but I just want to, if it's okay, ask one final question. Yes. And because um, a whole, Jane and Sally, Sharon, you've all asked questions um, related to how the government's going to support um, people with a disability. Sharon from Cassie in particular is looking, is asking about how the government's making best use of available uh, resources and, you know, in shared accommodation situations, making sure that we're using what's available. Can you speak really quickly to what the government's doing uh, yeah. for people with a disability in particular in the housing space? Yeah, so we um, we have committed to developing a um, disability housing action plan yes. and that will have some key, um, key measures in it um, backed up by funding and we've done a lot of consultation and QDN's been a, a big part of that. Um, process in terms of our broader social housing build, we do have targets on making sure that we deliver homes that are that are accessible. Noting that about 50% of people on the mm. register have a disability, and we also have an ageing population, so making sure that they're fit for purpose when we're delivering new builds. Um, we we have also um, some some of. I, we have the NDIS now, we have specialist disability accommodation. It's quite a complicated sector. Um, and so we're looking at how do you make sure that's as simple as possible. My brother has a disability and I've got to say my family were slightly confused with how, how many different parts of the system there are and it being that sometimes unclear to people what help is available and where to go. Um, so hopefully the Disability Housing Action Plan will mm. be able to try and assist with people navigating that system. Mm. Um, but there is definitely a lot of work to do. I know there's an NDIS as part of the National Cabinet discussion mm. this week. Um, uh, the system has evolved quite dramatically mm. with the introduction of the NDIS, but there's still a long way to go. And so I think we'll need to continue to engage with the sector and people with lived experience um, to understand how we can make sure we, we we help people and meet their needs. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for such a wonderful conversation, Minister. Um, and thank you for such an excellent answer to that final question. Uh, we could have de dedicated probably an entire hour to that yeah. particular topic. So apologies to those online um, that we didn't do as much justice to that question as we would have loved to have done. Um, can I thank you so much um, for spending so much time with us today, Minister? It's been a real pleasure and we, we really appreciate it. And to all of you online, thank you for being so engaged. Thank you for your questions. Uh, QCOS is currently consulting on our draft budget submission. So the submission has uh, gone into Treasury on uh, in accordance with the deadline, but we're continuing to get feedback from all of our members. Um, we've published one particularly about uh, the housing crisis and would love your feedback. Uh, as well, we'd also uh, love you to sign up to the Town of Nowhere campaign to end Queensland's housing crisis. Uh, and otherwise, uh, thanks so much for uh, joining us in our In Conversation uh, series this year. And uh, we look forward to seeing you for many more conversations in 2024. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>